title of the of the talk speaks for itself, so I'll talk about uh, shape correspondence and functional maps. And uh, the goal of my talk is not really to kind of give uh, a lot of uh, technical detail, but more to introduce a kind of a, an area. And uh, I'll uh, sort of give references as I go along, but uh, sort of the main uh, objective that I have is just to kind of, uh, especially for those who haven't seen these things before, to feel like you kind of know the general ideas and sort of the main uh, concepts, and then you can kind of go on and, and, and read up. But of course, if something is not clear, then you know, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. I think uh, you know, there's kind of an uh, interactive uh, talk. Okay. So um, <coughs> the overall sort of objective of the area that I'll be talking about is uh, to basically create uh, uh, tools for finding correspondences between shapes. And uh, I'll say a little bit more precisely what I mean by shapes in a second. But uh, the sort of the, the overall goal is to create maybe tools that, are, would, that would be somehow generic. So they wouldn't necessarily depend on the exact representation of the shapes. So you think about, for example, having uh, a point cloud, so you, you have a pair of shapes represented as a collection of points, or maybe triangle meshes, or even volumetric data, or images. And the goal is to somehow find uh, uh, similarities or, or find specific correspondences between them, right? Um, and uh, so we'll be studying basically this notion of mappings. And when I say mappings, um, I mean just the cor correspondence between a pair of, a pair of objects, right? And uh, <coughs> sort of kind of jumping very far ahead, the main kind of uh, idea that I would like to convey is that in many settings, rather than finding correspondences between points, it's often easier, both computationally and also from a conceptual point of view, to uh, find uh, relations between real valued functions. So if I have a pair of objects, so let, let's say I have these two uh, shapes, and uh, uh, I can either find correspondences between points on these shapes, or I can somehow find relations between real valued functions. So if I consider uh, a function which is encoded just by color, so blue corresponds to low value and red corresponds to high value, then somehow there's a no natural notion of correspondences between real valued functions. Right? And it seems like we're just kind of switching point of view, but uh, you'll see, hopefully, uh, in, in the next hour or so, that it becomes uh, a lot easier to talk about uh, correspondences between functions because essentially they have an algebraic structure, unlike points. So you can do many things with functions that you can't normally do with, um, with points. And the, sort of the, the, the consequence of this idea is that you can essentially represent a map or a correspondence as a matrix. And typically, these matrices are not very large. So you can manipulate them uh, very efficiently. So in addition to just kind of this idea of how do you find the optimal correspondence, another uh, sort of uh, thought or another uh, thing that I'd like to convey is that, in some sense, you can manipulate correspondences. So you can kind of make uh, a maps objects in their own right. So these objects are represented by these matrices, and they have some nice uh, properties that you can uh, sort of take advantage of. Okay, so that's sort of the main, the main uh, message. So um, just to kind of give a small announcement or maybe a few links in, in, in the very beginning. So uh, this, a lot of the slides that I'll present are based on a course that we did uh, at SIGGRAPH Asia uh, this past uh, uh, winter. And uh, you can find the course notes and the course slides for that course as well. And uh, especially, I mean, the, the slides, I mean, maybe are not so important, but the, the course notes, we uh, did, we sort of uh, put a lot of effort into creating a kind of a comprehensive uh, set of notes um, with uh, people who work in this field to kind of uh, present most of the ideas. So if some of the technical details are not clear from my talk, I, I really recommend you to go and take a look at these course notes. And uh, again, if something is not clear, of course, feel free to interrupt me. Or you know, if afterwards um, you, you would like to kind of uh, get a bit more understanding, also s send me an email. I'll be happy to respond. Um, and maybe kind of another thing that I want to convey is that you know this is not really an area that's kind of solved. So th this is really kind of work in progress. A lot of these ideas. And one of maybe my naive hopes is that uh, some of you might be interested to contribute to this area. And I think there is a lot of potential uh, uh, sort of uh, very fruitful directions um, in this particular domain, right? So if if you're uh, looking for a problem or if you're looking for uh, an application of an idea you have from a different maybe domain, it's I think a really nice. Um, I mean, of course I'm biased, but I think it's it's a it's it's a uh, potentially a productive direction.
So I hope to kind of uh, maybe have some more people work in this uh, direction. Okay. All right. So basically, uh, the the rest of this uh, kind of mini course is um, is organized through um, some um, these basic directions. So first, uh, I'll describe what we mean by shape correspondence and kind of give a taxonomy of different problems and uh, describe a little bit the solutions. Then I wanted to to describe something that's very very classical, which is uh, uh, sort of the most basic method for finding correspondences, uh, rigid uh, correspondences between shapes, called iterative closest point, which comes up also later on in non-rigid non correspondences. Um, then I'll talk about this functional map representation that I just mentioned and describe a sort of a basic pipeline for finding correspondences between non-rigid shapes. And at the end, I'll talk a, a bit about extensions um, and improvements and also mention some open problems, uh, just kind of also to stimulate some, some further thoughts. Okay. Um, right, so um, maybe just to kind of make things a little bit more precise, um, I'll talk a little bit, a lot about uh, finding, you know, correspondences between shapes. And uh, you know, since we're at a geometry processing uh, conference, uh, uh, the what we mean by a shape is something a little bit specific. So just to kind of make it clear, um, so we kind of have two parallel uh, uh, settings. We have the continuous setting where we imagine that there is some hidden underlying surface that is not known to us. And we also uh, imagine a kind of a discrete setting where we have a, a representation of an object which is given as a collection of points, uh, triangles and uh, edges, uh, so points and triangles, or just a collection of points, right? And um, in most settings, we assume that basically we have this uh, uh, object represented as just a, a triangle mesh. And a common assumption that we also make is that this is a connected, so you, you only have a single connected component, manifold, which in my particular setting simply means that every edge belongs to exactly two, tr two triangles and without boundary, right? So without boundary means, right, so you don't have uh, um, isolated triangles. Um, so uh, a lot of the things that I'll be mentioning are not dependent on these assumptions, but they're good to keep in mind because uh, I'll kind of describe a few practical constructions that work, um, especially when, when, you, when these assumptions are, are satisfied, right? Um, so uh, I'll uh, kind of show some results from some benchmarks, and these are the typical kinds of shapes that we deal with. So uh, the common benchmarks in this area of non-rigid correspondence, there is uh, uh, at least three that are really common. It's called, uh, so there's Faust, Scape, and Tosca, and they, they represent uh, typically kind of characters in different poses. So you have humans and uh, maybe some other characters, and the complexity of these uh, uh, shapes are between approximately five to 200,000 triangles. And this complexity becomes important as soon as you start doing computation. So you know, if you have a, a shape that contains 100,000 triangles, then even a quadratic algorithm very quickly becomes inefficient. So one of the goals is to develop algorithms that would be able to, to handle this kind of data, right? So um, this, is, this is something that's really important to keep in mind. Um, right, so what is sort of the overall goal of this area of uh, uh, shape matching? So we have um, basically a pair of shapes and our goal is to find correspondences between them, right? So somehow, intuitively, for us as humans, it's very easy to say that you know the tip of the ear on this armadillo on the left corresponds to the tip of the ear on the armadillo on the right. But um, the sort of the, the difficulty in the in this setting is to explain what we mean by a, a, a this correct correspondence, right? So when we come and we look at these two shapes, we come with a lot of prior knowledge about semantic meaning of different parts. But um, sort of our goal is to find these correspondences or to create algorithms that would be able to find such correspondences without any uh, semantic information. So uh, purely just by looking at the geometry of the objects, we want to be able to find these correspondences, right? Um, and uh, the, the, there are kind of two, two goals when you look at this problem. The first one is to just purely formulate it, um, you know, either on a piece of paper or as a kind of a, maybe an energy um, of what you mean by the best correspondence when you are looking for a map between two shapes, right? So there is a kind of a, an infinite, uh, uh, in the continuous case, or you know, exponential number in the discrete case of possible solutions, and somehow you'd like to find the best one, right? And uh, the first goal is to kind of write down what you mean by best, and the second one is to create an efficient algorithm that would be able to find the correspondence in practice, right? Um, so this problem is very old, of course, and has come up in many different uh, settings. 
And uh, I'll sort of probably go from the very, uh, the, the most traditional one to somehow one of the most challenging. But before I get into the particular problem, I want to really make clear what kind of uh, uh, correspondences we're talking about here. And this is not about the solution, so it's not about an algorithm, but it's more about the actual problem. And it's important to kind of distinguish what kind of setting we're talking about. So specifically in terms of the kind of problem that we're uh, considering, um, so the, the, the distinction that often is made is basically between local versus global. So local versus global means that uh, either the two shapes are already pre-aligned and local means you just need to find some kind of refinement. So it's basically to improve upon an existing solution. And pre-aligned could be even done by a person, right? So you have a modeler, they sort of pre-align the shapes and then you kind of try to morph one into the other. So that's, that's what I mean by local. Global means you, you don't have any information about the, 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 the position or the alignment of the two shapes. So you don't have any initial guesses. Um, then rigid versus deformable is kind of clear, right? So rigid means, you know, we just want to find the optimal rotation and translation. Deformable means, you know, we have articulated shapes with, they can undergo any kind of transformation. Um, then an important distinction also that is made and it's, some, it's often a little bit subtle and yeah, I, even when I talk about it, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's a bit controversial maybe, but basically this question of whether or not it's uh, automatic, uh, fully automatic or semi-automatic. And specifically for the purpose of today, what I, what I mean by uh, semi-automatic is when you have a pair of shapes and somehow maybe you have some landmark correspondences. So uh, a common scenario is that you have two shapes and maybe a modeler or you know, someone in a, in, in a software it uh, provides you a few landmark correspondences and then your goal is to extend these landmark correspondences, so a sparse set of correspondences, to a full dense set uh, of all the points on the shapes, right? And um, depending on how many correspondences you start with, um, this can be a very different problem, right? Um, but uh, the, sort of the, the more challenging case is you're just given two shapes with no uh, landmark correspondences, right? So your goal is to figure everything out fr from scratch, right? And this actually makes a huge difference whether or not uh, you have any landmark correspondences. Um, and finally, an important distinction that I think is going to come up more in Manuel's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, course is, is basically, do you have any uh, uh, sort of prior information? So maybe uh, a common scenario nowadays is that um, I give you a, a few shapes and some ground truth correspondences between them and then I give you a new pair and then the question is can you kind of learn some in information from these uh, known pairs that can be used on this new, uh, 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 new unknown pair of shapes, right? And uh, the sort of the, the opposite of this is just I give you just two shapes with, with just their geometry and your goal is to find the correspondence. So there's no prior information at all, right? So in some sense if you look at basically these uh, uh, um, sort of the left and right hand side, maybe you, you think that the left is typically easier, it's not, not always the case. But uh, today basically I uh, sort of, when I talk about uh, shape correspondence, I'll concentrate on this, on this kind of specific scenario. So we're given a pair of shapes and uh, they're deformable, um, so it's not just a rigid correspondence. And so this is, this is kind of maybe it should be put in quotes. So fully automatic is maybe a little bit uh, sort of too ambitious. So rather than having kind of landmarks, what I mean by fully automatic is that there's some a priori model of what we mean by good correspondences. And I'll describe it in, in just a second, right? So there are different kinds of ways of injecting information into the problem. And when I say automatic, I just mean we don't have landmarks. That's, that's the only thing that I mean, okay? And finally, this is not learning based. So for during my talk, there's no, uh, you know, probably sadly for many of you, there's, there's no learning. Um, okay. But I do think that this, these ideas can, can be used and, and maybe it will come up a little bit in Emmanuel's lecture. It, they can be used also in, in the learning scenarios as well. So that's kind of one of the nice things is that these representations that I'll talk about, they actually kind of lend themselves uh, to, to learning in, in a really natural way. So I think that's a nice, nice property as well. Okay, so um, one question is, you know, so, okay, so now we have this problem, so why would you want to solve it? Um, and just to give a little bit of motivation, um, basically, uh, if you have a correspondence between a pair of shapes, one of the most fundamental things that you can do is transfer information across these shapes, right? So for example, if you have some texture or parameterization, if you have some segmentation or labels, so maybe you know someone provides some uh, uh, segmentation of the shapes and you, you want to kind of transfer it to another shape, or 
a common scenario in computer graphics is you have uh, an animation of uh, uh, one shape and you basically want to transfer this animation to, to maybe another uh, shape. So you want to tr transfer these new poses that have been created by a modeler to, to this uh, sort of uh, new um, complex shape. And this can be very, very time consuming. So basically any operation where you can save time by doing this kind of information transfer uh, can be very valuable. There are many other uh, applications such as shape interpolation, reconstruction, e even statistical shape modeling, but they all sort of share this uh, spirit that if you have correspondences, then it makes it easier to kind of put the shapes into the same, in some sense, uh, uh, coordinate system where you can either transfer information or do uh, sort of process this inf uh, information jointly. So that's kind of the most important um, thing to keep in mind. When I think originally uh, the first instance of this uh, uh, shape correspondence of where it came up, um, or one of the first instances, is in manufacturing. And uh, here basically uh, one model can be a, uh, you know, a computer aided design model and another would be a scan. And your goal is to basically align the two um, and find maybe defects in manufacturing, right? So again, you can kind of compare shapes when, when you have these correspondences. Um, so, uh, let's maybe look at the one, the first kind of instance of this uh, shape correspondence problem. And uh, this, uh, I think, is kind of, yeah, this is important to know, maybe even if you're not uh, in this area, I think this really comes up in, in many different s scenarios. So basically, let's look at a slightly, uh, sort of, the, the simplified version. Suppose you have a pair of shapes, and uh, your goal is to find the optimal rigid alignment between them, right? So here I have, uh, kind of these two partial scans, or maybe two full scans even. And my goal is to find the optimal rotation uh, matrix and translation vector that would align one of these shapes with the other, right? And um, the key here is basically that the set of unknowns, so sort of the variables of your problem, are this rotation and translation. So there's a fixed number of, of unknowns. So how would you go about solving this? Um, um, so, like I said, this is a, a really old problem, and uh, probably the, the most classical solution is what's called the iterative closest point algorithm, which comes in many different flavors. But uh, just to give one specific uh, example, so he here's sort of uh, the, the, the basic idea. So, suppose I give you a pair of shapes, so here they're denoted by M and N, and uh, these are just two curves, okay? So, the same algorithm works regardless of the dimension, and this is really important. So suppose that uh, right now we're in 2D, and uh, my goal is to find the rotation of M that would align it as well as possible with N. So um, there's a key insight in the following sense. So suppose that you knew the correspondences between M and N. Suppose that for every point on M, you know its uh, exact uh, match on N. If you know that, then you can find the optimal rotation and translation. On the other hand, if you know the optimal rotation and translation, you can also find the correspondences, right? Um, because you can just rotate and then find the nearest name. So now, you know, when we start, we don't know either. So what do we do? We just iterate. So basically the idea is we first guess correspondences. So for every point on M, we find its nearest neighbor just in space on N. And in general, you know, maybe we're close. Uh, this is kind of a reasonable correspondence here. It maybe is okay as well. But then we also make some mistakes, okay? So we find all of these nearest neighbors on, uh, from one shape onto the other. And then we find the optimal rotation and translation for those particular correspondences, right? And then we apply this rotation and translation. And if we start close enough, if sort of the percentage of correct correspondences is, is sufficiently high, then at least maybe you won't get to the optimal solution, but you'll make some progress, right? So you end up with this kind of a slightly improved uh, uh, problem. So then once again, I find the nearest uh, uh, points, for every point in M, I find its nearest neighbor on N. Now again, I find the optimal rotation and translation, I apply it, um, and then I repeat, right? Okay, and eventually you, uh, if everything kind of uh, works out nicely, then eventually the two uh, shapes will correspond. And your final correspondences are just the, the map between the initial shape M and the final, its final transformed version, okay? So basically how, you know, if you were to implement this algorithm, you essentially need two building blocks. The first one is um, how do you find the nearest neighbors for every point xi uh, on m uh, on n, right? And the second building block is given these nearest neighbors, how do you find the optimal rotation and translation, right? 
And the nice thing is that we basically have very efficient tools that allow us to solve both of these problems very uh, easily. So um, basically, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, to find nearest neighbors, this is a very well studied problem. And especially in low dimensions, it works. Uh, uh, you can find very efficient data structures like a KD tree. Um, but even in higher dimensions, as long as your data is uh, distributed somehow nicely and you don't have just random data in high dimensions, um, then you can still find uh, nearest neighbors very efficiently. And uh, like, for example, if you use MATLAB, then there's just a, a, a like nearest neighbor search function that you can use uh, directly and it works quite efficiently. Now, the second question is, how do you find the optimal rotation and translation? And here, you can more or less just write down the following energy. So suppose that I have these xi's that are known and yi's that are now also known, because these are the nearest neighbors that come from the first step. Now, what is the optimal rotation matrix and translation vector that would minimize this, this energy, right? So if you look at this energy at first sight, it looks actually very easy because it's quadratic in both R and T. So you know, presumably you can just differentiate and find uh, uh, the optimal R and T. But there's a kind of a, a, a slight uh, difficulty here in that we're looking for an optimal rotation matrix. So this R is restricted to be this, uh, an orthonormal matrix. So you have to be careful um, how you solve this problem, and actually, it's not uh, this. The, the fact that R is an orthonormal matrix makes it uh, uh, much more tricky to find the optimal solution. But an optimal solution exists and can be found efficiently. And so, I actually kind of provide uh, the the actual uh, computation, which is given in this uh, classical paper. So basically, the you know, if I give you two sets of points that are in correspondence, and your goal is to find the optimal rotation and translation there is a sort of a closed form solution. So essentially what you do is you first construct a kind of a covariance matrix, right? Um, where you, f you first need to compute the, the mean, so the, the, the centroids of both xi and yi. And here it's actually important uh, to note that the, the, the centroid of y is not the centroid of the shape, of the target shape. It's the centroid of all of the target points, right? So on the target shape, you might have some points that don't participate. They're not uh, uh, a nearest neighbor of any point from the source, and you don't compute, the, you don't count those in, in the mean, right? So this, this mean is across all the target points. And then you basically need to compute the singular value decomposition of this uh, covariance matrix, and the optimal rotation is given just by uh, essentially setting the singular values to be one. Um, and you have to be careful to make sure you don't get a, a reflection matrix, but that's sort of a detail. And then uh, the optimal translation is just given by the, the difference between the centroid um, and the transform centroid. Okay, but the, the so the, maybe the exact formula is not as important, and of course I'm not going to prove that this is the, the optimal. But the thing that I want to really highlight is that this is a very fast uh, operation, right? So if I have uh, uh, you know even like uh, so basically the, the cost here is creating this uh, uh, covariance matrix. But this only, it doesn't depend, the size of this matrix doesn't depend on the number of points. It only depends on the dimension, right? So if we have points in 3D, for example, this covariance matrix C is just a three by three matrix. And computing a singular value decomposition, you know, of course, is, is very fast, right? So basically, this, this operation um, is, is, is a very somehow easy computational operation. And we'll use it actually later on. Okay, so let's say this was, uh, sorry, this is kind of generally clear. I mean, I guess maybe many of you have already seen this, but um, yeah. All right, if, if something doesn't make sense, definitely don't uh, hesitate to interrupt me. Okay, so um, let's, so this was kind of the rigid uh, uh, shape matching instance. Let's, but now, um, you know, we're kind of a little bit more ambitious these days, so we want to find a, a slightly uh, uh, sort of, we want to solve a slightly more difficult problem. And the question is, um, so suppose that I have these two pairs of shapes and they're not related by a rigid transformation. So there is no optimal, I mean, you can't find a rotation and translation that would align them perfectly. So um, you need to kind of um, find a, a different uh, 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 sort of space of solutions. And the difficulty here is the following. Yes. Yes, right, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so basically this is a really important issue that uh, in the first step we find the nearest neighbors, right? And if 
sort of the, the key assumption here is that like this step only makes sense if the two shapes are approximately aligned, right? It's actually very difficult to quantify what we mean by approximately aligned. And, uh, you know, I think in order to get an intuition, it's actually easier to just play with this algorithm, which is actually very easy to implement. Um, uh, but uh, basically, if I just have two shapes completely in different parts of space, this would definitely not work, right? So you can easily get trapped in a local minimum. And uh, so Nilo has done a, 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 a tremendous amount of work on analyzing this problem and providing good solutions even for uh, sort of better initializations. And uh, so, so you know, there, there are much more advanced versions of this algorithm. This is kind of the most basic one, okay? <coughs> Right, so now if we're moving to, to a different, uh, sort of more difficult uh, problem, which is non-rigid shape matching, um, the, the question is, um, and the first question that we have to sort of answer is, what, is, uh, what do we mean by a, a, a good uh, correspondence? And the difficulty that we have is essentially that, basically, um, we don't have a compact representation of the solution space. So in the rigid case, we had this uh, rotation and translation, so there's a fixed uh, uh, size, uh, fixed number of variables regardless of the number of points. But in the non-rigid case, in the sort of full generality, for every point x on the source, the space of solutions is basically any point on the target, right? And uh, this basically means that I have somehow n to the m possible solutions, and um, this is kind of really problematic computationally. And also, it's not even just the size, but also the space of solutions is really kind of nonlinear and non-convex. So if I look at, for example, the potential correspondences for a point x on the source, then um, sort of the, the space of possibilities is any point on the target, and this is a complex shape, right? So I can't even use like standard optimization techniques. So this, this already makes things uh, quite, quite difficult. Um, the other question that we need to answer is what do we mean by a good solution, right? So basically, what, what do we mean by a good correspondence? So now that the space of possibilities is kind of exponential, like any solution should be okay in a way, but like I said in the beginning, our goal is to kind of do everything geometrically. So to find uh, a good correspondence is purely based on the geometry. So first we have to write down what do we mean by a good solution. And, um, you know, there are many, many different formulations for uh, uh, sort of a reasonable uh, definition of what, I mean, what we mean by a good correspondence. But, uh, but like a model that I'm going to use for the rest of this uh, presentation is uh, what we call isometric shape matching. And the idea here is basically if I have a, a pair of shapes, one way to quantify how good uh, a map or a correspondence is, is by measuring how well it preserves distances on these shapes, right? And now the question is, what, how do we kind of measure distances? And here <coughs> we'll basically say that an iso so a good map is the one that preserves geodesic distances. So if I look at a pair of points x and y on, on the source shape, and I measure the geodesic distance, which is the length of the shortest path that lies, uh, uh, that lies on the surface of the shape, right? Um, then this geodesic distance uh, should be approximately preserved. So the distance between the images of x and y should be approximately equal to the distance between x and y itself, right? And why do we use geodesic distances? Basically, the intuition is that if you just use Euclidean distances, then these are easily changed, right? So that's basically, if I try to preserve all Euclidean distances, it would be equivalent to just solving the rigid correspondence problem, right? But um, if I have uh, articulated shapes, like, you know, the characters that I showed, then even if the Euclidean distance is changed, the, uh, under the change of pose, for example, often you have approximate geodesic distance preservation, okay? That's sort of the, the prior information that, that we start with. Um, there are, again, many other models for what uh, a good correspondence could mean, but this, this turns out to be a very, very actually powerful model. Now, okay, so let's say that we have this uh, model and we trust it. So how would you find a good correspondence um, uh, if sort of in practice? So maybe the simplest version would be something like this. So suppose basically I have the following energy. So I'm looking for the map T such that the distance, the, the, the distortion, so the difference between the geodesic distance on the source and the target is minimized. So I'm looking for the optimal correspondence T that would do that, right? So you can very easily imagine that this is a very difficult uh, uh, computational problem. And for example, if we're considering graphs, um, which like so far could actually fit into this framework, 
So basically, uh, solving the same problem on graphs would be equivalent to solving uh, a graph isomorphism problem. So actually, it would be slightly harder because graph isomorphism is basically, can you find the exact the, a solution that would give you zero error, right? So uh, computationally, this is already a very challenging problem. Um, and uh, you know, there's actually even kind of bigger problems that we have in the following sense. So here, how do I kind of optimize this energy, right? So one option would be to start with some solution and use some basic uh, sort of nonlinear optimization like gradient descent. But then you essentially would have to differentiate this energy with respect to the map which you can do, but then you know, the space of solutions is the shape, so you have to basically find a, a derivative on the surface, which, again, can be done, but it's quite tricky. Okay? So th this, this uh, is kind of a nice energy to keep in mind, but it's also very easy to see that this is very difficult energy to optimize. And so one question is, can we solve something like this, but with uh, maybe more efficiently in practice? Right? So that's sort of the motivation for the rest of the talk. Okay? Yes? No, no, no. Right, that's, that's actually a good, uh, really, really good point. So for now, let's assume that two sh the, the two shapes have the same topology, right? Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, any other questions? No? Okay, so, uh, right, so basically, like I said, the space of possible solutions is highly nonlinear, non-convex, so this is kind of what, what makes the problem very difficult, or among any, uh, many other things. Right, so basically what I'm going to describe is a kind of a different representation for correspondences or mappings that makes solving problems like this a little bit easier, right? And this is based on this idea that I mentioned in the beginning where of finding correspondences between functions rather than between points. And basically uh, uh, I'll describe what we call this functional map representation um, that um, um, essentially allows us, kind of, if you just look at this image, to represent a correspondence as just a matrix and optimize in the space of these matrices. Right? So rather than optimizing in the space of correspondences, you optimize in the space of these matrices, which makes somehow the problem a little bit more tractable. Um, and, but it also has some nice other properties. So in addition to sort of the allowing to solve this problem or giving you a tool to solve this problem, it also has some nice properties. So um, it kind of allows you to analyze uh, maps uh, in, a slight, in kind of a global multi-scale way. It also allows to represent more general correspondences. So in certain cases, you might have a, a setting where a point-to-point -point map actually doesn't make sense. Maybe you have two shapes that have very different uh, sampling. So maybe one is very coarse and one is very dense. It doesn't quite make sense to say this particular point goes to this particular point, right? But it might make sense to say this point goes to some region, right? So there's some kind of uncertainty in this specific uh, location. So this kind of representation allows you to do that. Also, you can do uh, sort of algebraic manipulations like averaging or composition using these matrices. And then finally, I'll show how it can be used to, to, to solve this problem. Okay? So that's sort of the motivation. So um, maybe to, in the beginning, um, one thing that's really going to come up a lot is uh, what we call this Laplace Beltrami operator. So I want to kind of provide a definition. Um, and maybe I, so I wasn't here yesterday, but I would imagine that it came, it like came up in, in, in other courses, um, maybe in Keenan's. Um, and uh, so this is something that's really coming up a lot in geometry processing. I mean, it's uh, a really classical construction. So basically, um, so what's, what's a Laplace Beltrami operator? So suppose that I have, so now we're, we're kind of in the continuous setting. So we're not talking about triangle meshes for now. So imagine you're in a smooth surface. And uh, so let's call it M. So the Laplace Beltrami operator, delta, is something that takes real valued functions. Okay, so suppose I have some real valued functions. So here's a M, my M is a sphere. Okay, and I have a real valued function where color represents how large the value is. So this delta, the Laplace Beltrami operator, you can think of it as something that kind of, you know, takes in functions and produces other functions, right? So it takes smooth functions and produces other smooth functions on the same, on the same surface. And uh, it's defined as essentially the divergence of the gradient of a function, or depending on how you define divergence, you have to put a minus here. Um, and kind of intuitively, it has the following, uh, uh, it, it sort of does the following. So suppose I have this, this function f, I first <coughs> compute the gradient of f, so that's a vector field that points essentially in the direction of highest uh, increase of f. And then I compute the divergence of f, which is basically a measure for a vector field of how much every point is a sink or a source of this vector field, right? So here I have a sink, uh, 
So it will have a very small value. On the opposite side of the sphere, I'll have a source, so it will have a high value. Okay? So, so that's sort of the, the intuitive definition. Um, it's also, so one of the main places where it comes up is, is the heat uh, diffusion equation. So basically suppose that F is the temperature, so I have a, a surface and at uh, time zero I uh, have some distribution of temperature on the surface. And now the question is how is this temperature going to evolve over time? And sort of the most uh, classic PD for this is that the, the evolution of this temperature in time is equal to the Laplace Beltrami operator. And so let's see, I have this small video here. So if I have this distribution of heat in the beginning, then you can imagine that basically it starts, the heat starts propagating um, sort of away from uh, the, the high, uh, uh, highly peaked areas and eventually kind of becomes constant on, on the surface, right? So this is where the laplace Beltrami operator comes in. Um, and it has some very nice properties um, that are going to be extremely useful in, in the rest of this presentation. So the first property that it has is that it's invariant under isometric deformations. So if I have two shapes or two surfaces and I transform, or let's say I have one surface and I transform it in a way that preserves geodesic distances, right? then this Laplace Beltrami, Beltrami operator is going to be preserved as well. Okay, So that's kind of the, the first um, result. And why is it going to be preserved? Because essentially you can express everything in terms of geodesic distances. Okay? It doesn't depend on the embedding at all. If I rotate, translate, it's, it is preserved. Okay? Also, it has what's called a countable eigen decomposition. So this is a little bit technical, but it means something very simple, actually. So for there is there's a, a, a countable set of functions that are indexed by the eigenvalues. Right? So I have a set of eigenvalues lambda i and real valued function, smooth functions phi i. That, uh, that satisfy this uh, 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 eigenvalue equation. Um, and it forms an orthonormal basis for the space of functions. So I'll describe in more precisely what this means in a second. And also, uh, something else that's going to come up is, is the following. So suppose that I have a map between two shapes that preserves the Laplace Beltrami operator, right? So, like I said, if the map preserves distances, it will have to preserve the Laplace Beltrami operator, but the opposite is also true. So if it preserves this operator, it must also preserve the geodesic distances. So it, it characterizes the, the, the geodesic distances fully. Okay? Um, right. So uh, the second property that I mentioned, that it forms an orthonormal basis for the space of functions, what does it mean? Um, so first, uh, basically, uh, these are the eigenfunctions of this Laplace Beltrami operator. So the first eigenfunction is kind of the smooth, the smoothest possible function is just a constant function, right? So if I have the constant function, then it's very easy to see that basically applying the Laplace Beltrami operator to it is just going to give you zero because the gradient of a constant function is zero already, right? So this, uh, the constant function corresponds to the zero eigenvalue. And basically, you have this increasing set of eigenvalues that somehow go from the smoothest to the, to the maybe high oscillate, more and more oscillating, right? And uh, intuitively, what do we mean by, by smooth in this setting is basically the, the, the functions, uh, these Laplace Beltrami eigenfunctions, they minimize this kind of Dirichlet energy, which basically is just the norm of the gradient of the function, okay? So, I mean, the, this exact interpretation is maybe not so fundamental, but what you have to keep in mind is basically that, you know, I give you this operator and then there is a kind of a, a, a set of functions that uh, goes from the smoothest to the more and more higher frequency. And, I mean, if you guys, like, probably uh, almost all of you have seen uh, Fourier analysis, this is exactly the uh, equivalent of Fourier analysis on surfaces, right? So, the standard Fourier... Uh, uh, basis is sines and cosines, and they go, they're ordered by frequency, and this is exactly the same thing that happens on, on surfaces, right? So we have a kind of a natural generalization of Fourier bases to, to surfaces, okay? And uh, also, so this uh, basis, uh, this, this, these eigenfunctions form an orthonormal basis for the space of uh, square integrable functions. So what does that mean? So suppose I give you a function, okay? So like the square integrable is not very important. So basically think of just any function more or less, okay? So nice, any nice uh, reasonable function. So basically, uh, if I give you some function on this, on this shape, I can express it as a linear combination of these eigenfunctions where um, these AIs are scalar values and phi i's are, are the basis functions that I, that I mentioned earlier that don't depend on f, okay? So f can be written as a linear combination of the basis functions, and these scalar coefficient a i are just 
the inner product, basically the integral between f and phi i on the surface. Right? So this is actually a really nice property that we're going to use in, in just a second. Right? Okay. So um, how uh, I'm, uh, you know, so one thing I actually forgot to mention in the beginning is that for basically everything that I'm describing today on this course website for SIGGRAPH Asia, we put out code um, that implements all of these uh, or the majority of these algorithms. And so if you want to play around with this, you can easily kind of just most of it is in MATLAB, just run it and, and see how it works. So basically, one little piece that you will see in this code is that given a shape or given a triangle mesh. There is some functions that allow you to compute both this discretization of this Laplace Beltramio operator, which is uh, uh, you might have seen is, is uh, uh, given by the standard cotangent Laplacian, and then also you can compute these eigenfunctions. So um, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail where this formula comes from, but it, it can be obtained from first-order finite elements. Um, but and at the end of the day, this Laplace Beltramio operator in practice, so for discrete triangle meshes, is just a, a, a matrix, or it's a, it's a product of two matrices. One is diagonal, and one is a, a large symmetric sparse matrix. Okay. Um, and so to compute these eigenfunctions, you can use the sort of standard routines um, uh, uh, once again. And one of the sort of uh, insights here is that to compute an eigenfunction, this uh, eigen decomposition for a set of uh, 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 functions on, on a surface, so let's say I have uh, a triangle mesh with n vertices, then this Laplace Beltrami operator, this matrix, is going to be an n by n matrix, but it's very sparse, right? So the number of non-zero elements is roughly is just the number of edges, which is linear in in the number of vertices. So it's a very sparse matrix, and you can compute these functions phi i um, by, for example, in practice using uh, this eigs function in MATLAB that can be very efficient, right? So um, for for example, here I did some com calculation. So for, like on on a laptop, it takes about uh, let's say three, se three and a half seconds for a mesh with 50,000 triangles to compute the first 100 basis functions. Okay. Uh, I think it probably assumes Neumann boundary conditions. Basically, if you don't do anything and just use the cotangent uh, Laplacian, then it's equivalent to Neumann boundary conditions. And I think that's what the code does. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure it should handle If it has non-manifold, uh, it's not going to work, but yeah. OK. Um, right, so this is kind of just a little bit of background. And uh, uh, this uh, is important because it's going to come up later a lot. OK, so now let's go back to our problem. So um, our problem was basically to find this correspondences between shapes. So. Uh, Let's say for a second that I have a, a pair of shapes and I know a correspondence between them. Okay, so I have these two shapes M and N, and someone gives me a map. And here it's kind of important because the map is from N to M. Okay, so this is a map in this direction. Now, one of the sort of very very simple observation is the following: um, I can use this map, and this is actually why one of the reasons why you compute these correspondences to transfer information. So, what's the simplest information you can transfer is real valued functions. So suppose that um, I have a function on M. So this is a, a, a function from M to, to the real line. So this is a real valued function. This is just denoted by color. I can use this map T to transfer it onto N, right? Just by composition. So for every point on N, I kind of uh, use this map to find its correspondence. And then I borrow the value of F back onto N, right? So that's how I transfer uh, a, a real valued function. So the, the idea is basically any map t from n to m induces a correspondence between real valued functions, right? So if I know what this t is, I can use it to transfer information. So and of course, um, you know, for a fixed uh, map t, I can transfer any function, right? So the, the, there is no relation between this t and, and the transfer function. And so um, the kind of the key uh, part here is that um, this correspondence between points induces correspondences between functions. The only slightly thing you have to kind of be careful is that the correspondence between functions is in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, but uh, this correspondence between functions has certain nice properties. So let's kind of list them. So the first property is that it's linear. So suppose that I have a, a linear combination of uh, two functions on, on the source shape, on M. Okay, so here these alphas are scalars and f1 and f2 are functions. 
So the output, so the, the, the sort of the result of this transfer between function that I'm going to denote by T sub F is a linear combination of the transfer between the individual functions. And why is this? Is just basically by the definition, more or less, right? The only thing that I'm doing to transfer functions, I'm just kind of borrowing values, right? So if I give you a linear combination on the source, I'll get a linear combination on the target, right? That's kind of uh, just more or less by definition. Um, the other kind of nice property is that it's somehow complete. So what, what I mean by complete is basically, suppose that someone kind of gave you an oracle that was able to transfer any function, but it didn't tell you which correspondence t it came from, right? So let's say that, you know, I have this transformation between functions, but I forgot which, which initial map between points it, it is associated with, right? So the only thing I can do is transfer functions, but I don't know wh which points are corresponding to which points, right? And the question is, can you reconstruct the, the correspondence between points just by using this correspondence between functions? And the answer is, of course, yes, by essentially what you can do is just kind of feed to your oracle these highly peaked uh, functions. So for example, delta function, which is just one on a point and zero everywhere else, and you look at its image, and then that gives you the correspondence, right? So this, this map T sub F encodes all of the information that you had in the initial map between points. And this, this is very important, right? So this is what I mean by completeness, okay? Okay, so now um, let's kind of uh, look, look a little bit more closely by, uh, at what this linearity gives us. So suppose that I have this function f on the, on the, on the uh, source, and let's say that, remember I said that I can use, for example, the Laplace Beltramian eigenfunctions as a basis, so that I can write this f as a linear combination of my basis functions, right? So here, these a sub i's are scalars and phi sub i's are some basis functions. For example, you can think of the Laplace Beltramian eigenfunctions. And also similarly for the image, so for, the, so for, for this result of the transfer, for G, I can once again write it as a linear combination of the basis functions. And now, um, you know, because we know that this T sub F, the transfer between the source and the target is linear, that means that there must be a linear transformation between my coefficients A sub I and my coefficients B sub J, right? So B sub I, right? So basically I have a, a vector of values of the scalar coefficients of the uh, function on the source, and I have a vector of values of the scalar coefficients of the function on the target, and because I know that this transformation is linear, there must be a linear transformation between these two, right? And, you know, this is almost like a trivial observation, but it turns out to be extremely, uh, extremely useful, okay? So let me just uh, give a slight kind of uh, <laughs> illustration of what, what, what we mean here. Um, and this is a really nice image that uh, Michael Bronstein, I think, produced. No? Michael? Yeah, okay. So basically, um, suppose that I have some function f on, on this uh, shape m, and I write it as a linear combination of some basis functions, okay? And I know that this function gets transferred onto some function g on the target shape, right? And we know that there's a, there's a linear, basically, map between these ai's and these b, bi's, okay? And so what we can basically write, this, this, this correspondence T sub F, is, is a composition. So first, I find basically what are the coefficients of my function on M. So that's my, the, the pseudo inverse of phi, phi M. Then I basically find some linear transformation between the coefficients. And then I, once again, create this uh, function on the target. And this matrix C that does this translation between the coefficients is exactly uh, what, what I call this functional map representation. Okay, so um, let me kind of give an actual definition. So suppose that I have some fixed choice of basis function. This is very important. So the choice of basis functions is not dependent on the correspondence, right? So for every shape, I specify some set of basis functions, um, uh, and I write phi sub m and phi sub n. And now I have some linear transformation between uh, the space of functions defined on these two shapes. And so, um, Basically, uh, there must exist a matrix C such that for any f, which is linear, uh, written as a linear combination of these basis functions, and every image of f, uh, which is written as a linear combination of the basis functions on the target, then the vector of coefficients must be equal to just a linear transformation between the vector of the coefficients in the beginning and, and the, some fixed matrix C. Okay? So basically, this matrix C is just a translation matrix that translates coefficients uh, with respect to phi on m to coefficients with respect to phi on m, right? Okay, yes.
That's an excellent question. Uh, do you mind if I answer it a little bit later? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but well, that's a great question. But maybe I can just say, like, kind of very quickly, is that basically if you just use the the let's say the indicator functions, right? That could be a perfectly good basis on the points. Um, the issue is that in the end, I'm going to use this matrix C to find correspondences, right? And the issue is that if I use the standard indicator functions, then this matrix C will have a size n by n, okay? Which is kind of the initial problem that we started with. And the, the, the sort of one of the kind of tricks or one of the ideas is that you can rephrase this problem in a different basis, right? Where it becomes much more compact. Does it kind of generally answer? Okay. I think it becomes a bit more clear later, but yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so now, um, so, uh, right, so this uh, the, the sort of the one thing you can show is that basically if the space of uh, basis functions is orthonormal, then there's a closed form expression for the C uh, i j, okay? So you can kind of find what the C i j is. Okay, so let me give an example. So suppose I, give two, I have two shapes with a correspondence T, and uh, um, here I can just express this correspondence T as a matrix, with one, uh, one per column and zeros everywhere else, which just tells you, where, you know, every point where, where it goes on, on the target. Then if functions are represented as vectors in the, in the standard you know, indicator basis, then this transformation between functions is just equal to the transpose of the transformation between points, right? So if you think of just standard permutation matrices, which is exactly what this T is, it's just a permutation matrix, then this kind of functional map in this basis becomes just a transpose, okay? And the reason it's the transpose is because remember the map between points goes in the opposite direction between maps between functions. Now, if I have a different if I have a different basis, right? Like for example, I have these Laplace Beltrami eigenfunctions. I can represent them as vectors of some matrices. Okay, so I have uh, these phi m and phi n represent some first k eigenfunctions of of my uh, Laplace Beltrami operators on, on on the surfaces. Then this map. <laughs> this functional map representation is just uh, kind of the same as before, except you need to, uh, you know, pre and post multiply by the two, by the two um, basis matrices, okay? So the C, in a way, is just a change of basis matrix. There's nothing else, actually. Okay? Um, right. So uh, this one thing here is basically what do we mean by pseudo-inverse? Because these are typically non-invertible, so I, I wrote out, like, the actual expression for the pseudo-inverse. Um, this, by the way, is also in the code, so I think you can find it. Okay, so here's just an example. So suppose I have a source shape and I have some, course, some uh, uh, target shapes, and here I encode the correspondence just by the same color. So uh, if two points have the same color, that means that they're in correspondence. It's a bit hard to see, but more or less you can just think of the correspondence as kind of the intuitive correspondence you would have. So, you know, this tip of the uh, uh, paw here corresponds to this tip, so it's like the sort of the standard correspondence. And this just shows that basically uh, between these two shapes, every correspondence induces a matrix. So this matrix in this is uh, represented as in, in this Laplace Beltrami basis. Okay? And for example, if I uh, put this uh, uh, kind of use the standard correspondence, then I have this kind of matrix. Then if I have another correspondence which maps this point to its kind of symmetric opposite, right? So I just flip left and right. Then I have another matrix, which actually looks uh, similar. And then if I have a map between, you know, let's say, the paws and the tail, then I have a kind of a, a completely different matrix. And one observation um, that you can make is that these kind of reasonable maps correspond to diagonal matrices in this basis. And we can actually prove that this is the case, right? So I'll, I'll show in a second that this is not just a coincidence, okay? All right. And here's an example of where this basis reduction actually helps. So suppose I have these different shapes. So I have some source shape and a few other shapes and the correspondence between them. And each of these is 30,000 vertices. And here on the x-axis, I show the number of basis functions that we use to represent this map. And on the y-axis, I basically show how um, kind of much can we recover the initial point-to-point uh, -point correspondence from this, uh, from this uh, small matrix, right? And if I have a, a very small number of basis functions, then 
I make a huge error, but as I increase the number of these basis functions, so here it's, uh, again, maybe not easy to see from far away, but roughly around 50 to 80 basis functions, I make an error that's less on average than one edge length of the mesh. Okay? So what that means is that I can represent a correspondence between two shapes that contain roughly 30,000 points each by a matrix of size 80 by 80. Okay? And this is the key insight that we're going to use by basically uh, uh, phrasing this computational you know, optimization problem as just a, a, a problem in, in matrices of size 80 by 80. Okay? Um, right. So um, this functional map representation has some nice properties also. So first, for example, map composition. So if I have two shapes, uh, sorry, three shapes and two maps between them, so composing maps just corresponds to multiplying matrices. So I just uh, do matrix multiplication. Also map inversion corresponds to matrix inversion. So if I have a map in the opposite direction, for example, for a bijection, I can find the inverse just by inverting the matrix. Um, you can also do certain things with this functional representation that you can't do with normal correspondences. So let me give an example. So here I have a, a pair of shapes and two different correspondences between them, right? One of them maps left to left and the other one maps left to right. And because I have these matrices, so each of these correspondences is represented as a matrix, I can do averages, right? So I can just write a, a linear combination of the two matrices, which kind of makes sense because what I can do is I can just take a, a function and kind of uh, uh, map it to both left and right just by kind of considering as, as for example a probability distribution which you cannot do if you just have point-to-point -point correspondence okay right yes Sorry. can you go back two slides the plot yeah this one uh, is it correct that the blue curve is uh, oscillating uh, like the error is increasing at the very beginning the oh it's sure. increasing yeah. as you uh, yeah. the number of eigen functions. How can you explain that? Uh, I have certain, like, I have a few hypotheses. I mean, in general, like, this is not guaranteed to decrease. Right? I mean, as, as a general trend, it should decrease. But, for example, if you increase just by one the, the, the size of the basis, you can sometimes run into trouble because if you have, for example, repeated eigenvalues, it can be unstable. You know, so maybe, um, yeah. So there is no like rule that says that you definitely decrease. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the use of the Abbas Bhatnami eigenfunction mm -hmm. is predicated on the fact that the transformation is isometric. Yes. If I have a transformation which is not isometric, yeah. uh, can I use the same framework just by finding that basis which is invariant to that transformation? Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. I, I think that's an excellent uh, uh, research problem. <laughs> and. Uh, um, we, I think, right, so maybe I'll actually describe it a little bit, but yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So the linearity part is got nothing to do with isometry, right? Yes. Uh, only from the fact that it's got isometry. Absolutely, yes. And these properties that I mentioned are also in, independent of the isometry. Okay? All right, so let me describe a basic pipeline for finding correspondences using this representation. Um, and. Uh, Right, so basically, you know, in the beginning I said, okay, we want to actually uh, find correspondences. So these properties that I just mentioned were, <coughs> assuming I give you a map, T, between points, it has a functional representation, so it has some nice properties. But what we actually want to do is find the correspondence. So how can we use this representation to find these correspondences? Um, right. So basically, th here's a small insight. So suppose that um, I don't know what the correspondence uh, between the two shapes is. I can often find... Fun pairs of functions that if I did know the correspondence, they should be approximately preserved. So for example, if we have preservation of distances, it should also, sorry, preserve curvature, right? So one function could be the Gaussian curvature on, on the source shape, and another function is the Gaussian curvature on the target shape, right? And so I don't know what the correspondence is, uh, this map C is, but I can say that um, you know, the c times a should approximately be equal to b, where a and b are the coefficients of some uh, source and uh, target functions. Right? So um, you know, what kind of correspondences between functions can you have? So one of them is, for example, curvature. Um, others uh, could be some different kinds of descriptors. So if you work, for example, in, in image domain, people have come up with a lot of very powerful descriptors. And you can uh, phrase descriptors as just functions, basically, on, on the source and the target. And the insight is that if I knew, so if I uh, have, um, you know, uh, these pairs A and B, then I can basically find the map C that approximately aligns all of these functions, right? And um, so the, the kind of the, the, the lesson is that 
given enough A and B pairs, you can recover C, right, by uh, more or less just solving a linear least squares problem. So C times A equals to B, so if I make this into an energy, I just say that I want to find the optimal C that would minimize some error, then finding an optimal C is just solving a least squares problem, right? Um, so what kind of functions do we have? So, you know, for example, if you have some color or texture information, you can have descriptor. Also, if somebody provides you landmark, info, la so point-to-point -point correspondences, so if there is some sparse uh, landmark correspondences, you can phrase those as well uh, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, function preservation by, for example, creating distance to the, to the landmarks, right? So that gives you pairs of functions. Also, if you have part correspondences, so somebody comes in and says, I, I know that certain parts should correspond, Right? I don't know precise points between them, but you can phrase that again as a preservation of functions by, for example, creating indicator functions on the parts. Right? And this uh, can all kind of uh, uh, be used in this framework. Another kind of constraint that turns out to be very useful is commutativity with other operators. So again, suppose that I don't know what the C is, but often I have certain uh, uh, functional operators that take functions on the source and produce other functions on the source, and the same <coughs> take functions on the target and produce other functions on the target. And in this kind of situation, you basically expect this diagram to commute. So if I have a, a, a sum function and I transfer it onto the target and apply this uh, operator as S sub n, it should be the same as applying the operator on the source and, and then mapping it, right? And for example, I just mentioned, you know, the laplace Beltrami operator is like the most classical uh, operator probably on, on surfaces for us. So for laplace Beltrami operator, this kind of diagram should commute precisely when correspondences, when, when you have isometry. So you have a map that preserves geodesic distances exactly corresponds to this condition that this uh, diagram should commute. And the nice thing is that this energy is also quadratic in C, right? So um, uh, basically, to find the optimal C, once again, you can just use a least squares problem, right? Um, so I just kind of wrote down a few different properties. So for example, a mapping is isometric if and only if the function map uh, matrix commutes with the Laplacian, right? So th this is a, uh, I mean, we kind of show in this paper, or it's kind of mentioned in this paper. Um, and this actually, you can kind of very easily see that this is the reason why we had these matrices that were approximately diagonal, because this, this kind of this uh, property actually implies that in the Laplace Beltrami basis, the, the, the correspondence should be a diagonal matrix. Okay? Also, you can show that if the map is locally volume preserving, so if it preserves areas, uh, um, not necessarily uh, distances, but just areas, then this corresponds to orthonormal matrices. Um, and you can show that the mapping is conformal if uh, there's a kind of relation between Laplace Beltrami operators, um, but the transpose of the matrix. Okay? So there are some properties that basically relate the property of the map to its, the property of the, of the functional map representation. Okay? Right, so how, does this how can we translate this into an algorithm? So uh, what we do is the following. So first, basically, given a pair of shapes M and N, we first uh, compute a fixed number of eigenfunctions on both the source and the target, and typically it's between 80 and 100. Store them as matrices in these uh, phi sub M and phi sub N. Then we compute some descriptor functions, okay? So uh, again, I'm not going to go into too many details about what kind of descriptor functions we use, but it's is a bit of an open problem and there's a lot of work on, on, on really powerful descriptors. And then we basically represent those descriptors as columns of some matrices A and B when represented in this basis. And then we find the optimal map C by basically uh, uh, solving this uh, optimization problem. So the first term basically says this, this map should pr uh, preserve the descriptor values, and the second term says that this map should approximately preserve distances. Right? And what's kind of remarkable is that, first of all, the number of unknowns is fixed and is independent of the number of points. Right? So this is only like 80 to 100. And also that this energy is, is basically quadratic in C, so you can just find the optimal C by solving a least squares problem. Uh, one question that comment so the transition from point to point in this eigenvalue okay. of the current emission. Now the problem sort of switched to the mapping of the eigenvalue right. across different shapes. Right. So that there is some inherent problem that remains that remains in the first slide when you ordered the first shape. Right. Yeah. So there is not one C in case of symmetry, there will be multiple C's of different ordering. Yes. 
it's a bit it's a bit more than just the ordering right it's you basically so this is kind of the so there's not a one to one correspondence between the 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 functions the the basis functions you have basically linear combination so if it was a one to one then it would be just a diagonal matrix but you see here we have actually you know some a bit more complex structures and this is actually very important right so but you're right, right? If you have symmetries, then you have multiple solutions. So you have to be especially careful when you're dealing with symmetries. Um, but yeah, I mean, so basically, if you have an ordering sw switch, you'll still have a, a, a mapping. It's fine. But just it will look maybe a bit differently, right? Yeah. Sorry, any, any other questions? OK, so um, Right, so we have this basic pipeline. So, okay, and then the final step is how do we convert this functional map C, so correspondence between functions, to correspondence between points. Um, and here I just want to give a, a briefly two different possibilities, and one of them is actually what we use in practice. And um, uh, uh, basically, so the question is, given a, this functional map matrix C, how do we find the corresponding point-to-point -point map? So this, the first option, which is what I alluded to a bit earlier, is that for every point on the source, we create a delta function, which is just an indicator function of that, uh, of that point, and then we map it onto the target using this matrix C, and then we look at the maximum, for example, what is the point that maximizes the image, right? And that would be my correspondence. The problem with this approach is that, first of all, it has high complexity. So the complexity is n, uh, so it's the product of the, of the, of the number of points, right? So for every point on the source, I have to create a function which has complexity n times n, and then I have to basically find the maximum, which again has complexity n times n. And also it has low accuracy. So what we do is slightly, something a little bit different. So basically we find um, the, the, uh, the point that uh, minimizes the distance in these laplace bertrami uh, representations. So I create a delta functions on the, on the source, I map it using the C, and then I find its nearest neighbor in this uh, uh, space of functions represented in the Laplace Petrami basis, okay? And uh, using efficient uh, data structures for nearest neighbors, you can reduce this to n log m, okay? So basically, this becomes a fairly efficient step. Um, right, so, um, okay, so one last thing I want to mention is uh, often, you know, I said that uh, correspondences uh, that uh, preserve areas should correspond to orthonormal matrices. So uh, these matrices, uh, uh, C transpose C equals identity. And here, when I was solving this problem, I didn't incorporate this constraint in any way, right? So this, there's no mention of the C transpose C equals identity. And the reason is because basically this makes the problem nonlinear, right? And actually non-convex as well. But what we can do is actually use this iterative close, close support idea to, in the same way, um, but in a higher dimension. So the idea is the following. So um, suppose that I first compute this uh, functional map C, then I use the procedure I just described to convert it to a point-to-point -point map, and then I find a new functional map that would basically now I fix these correspondences that are known, and I basically find the, the, the map that is orthonormal that would minimize this error, right? And remember that this iterative closest point algorithm in the rigid case solves exactly this problem, right? Just in 3D. So we can use the same exact algorithm just in a higher dimension. Okay, so uh, this, this problem uh, uh, is in some sense easy. And so what we do is basically we start, at least the first algorithm that we proposed, was to first find this correspondence matrix C, convert it to a point-to-point -point map, and then use this iterative refinement. Okay? So you start with a reasonable guess for correspondence, and then you kind of refine. Okay? Oh, so uh, here are some examples of correspondences um, that you can get this way. Um, there are some parts that I didn't mention, and if you really want to so, like, sort of see all the technical details, then you know, of course you're welcome to look at the code or maybe ask me if, if you're interested. So these are the kinds of correspondences that you can expect, roughly. Um, and you know, this was a paper from 2012, so now it's been improved a lot. Um, what we also do is in this, in this kind of domain is we show these kinds of plots, where basically you have some benchmarks, so you have two different kinds of benchmarks, and on the x-axis, you look at basically uh, some geodesic threshold. Um, so in these benchmarks, you know ground truth correspondences between points on all the shapes, right? So this is kind of hidden, like this is something you'd like to replicate. And so for you to test your algorithm, you first compute the correspondence, and you see how far is this correspondence from the ground truth, right? And basically, ideally, all your correspondences should be zero from the ground truth, but you know, of course not, so you basically have some kind of error. So that's how you more or less compare algorithms in this, in this domain, right? 
um, and the kinds of error that you get, so here is maybe 0 0.05 is, you know, like this kind of radius. So like roughly 90% of correspondences are within this sort of light blue radius. But again, this has been improved a lot since, since then, but this is just to give you an, an idea. Um, so just one thing I want to mention at the end is basically um, this is something, um, you know, so something that we've been trying to work on since uh, sort of this uh, ideas got started is basically in some sense the, d the most difficult part of this algorithm is actually the last one, right? So finding the optimal matrix C is, is in some sense easy or you can do certain things that, that you know you can do find it efficiently. The problem is converting it to a point-to-point -point map, right? So often a lot of error arises in that particular step and one of the questions is what can you do without this step, right? Can you enable applications without actually ever converting your functional correspondence to a point-to-point -point one. And uh, um, just to mention one, one p small application is, you know, transferring segmentations. So suppose that I have a shape and I have some segments that are kind of uh, predefined and uh, um, I can just use indicator functions of these segments and just use my functional correspondence directly to transfer segmentations. And for this, I actually don't need to uh, convert this functional map to a point-to-point -point one, right? I can directly transfer this information as just a set of functions, right? Okay, so I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip all of the extensions and improvements, but I do want to say um, just one last thing at the end about open problems. Um, okay, so um, basically, um, this is kind of, I mean, to me, it's very important to, uh, <coughs> to, um, sorry, do I have time or am I? Ah. ah, okay, okay. Okay, my computer tells me it's an hour and a half, so then, okay, maybe I, I have a little bit of time. So let me show you my favorite extensions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So maybe let me, uh, like, I was maybe a bit rushing at the end, so if you guys have questions about anything that I described. <laughs> Yes. I should have asked the scenario. So is it the same number of triangles in every shape all the time, or can you skip triangles when you do the correspondence? Uh, it's a great question. So basically, um, for example, um, you know, if you look at this pipeline, here, it like nothing depends on the number of uh, <coughs> on, on the number of points or triangles being the same, right? <coughs> so. Um, you can totally, like, it doesn't matter if you have the same number of points or triangles. The only thing that will happen is if you don't have the same number of points or triangles, during this conversion, you will basically not get a bijection, right? Um, but most of the time, even if you do have an, uh, the same number of points or triangles, you won't get a bijection anyway, because that's, we don't know how to enforce it very well, right? Um, but one thing that we have, which is a bit, I think, uh, tricky, um, is that in these benchmarks, they typically have the same number of points and triangles. And this actually creates a kind of bias in certain algorithms. So it's not easy to create a benchmark where you know the ground truth correspondences, but not this, they're not given with the same number of points and triangles. So, uh, yeah. Yes. So then this, this actually is the composition ensures that for points which don't have this, this correspondence, you will get, get some kind of interpolation between, between two values. Right. So you'll get a perfectly fine functional map. It's, it's, it's fine. But then just the conversion to a point to point is basically where the errors will, will happen. For the conversion, uh, too much effort for something not so important. Uh, instead of mapping to point to point, you can try to map to point to surface. Right. Right. Once you get to point to point, then you can locally refine the quality of it. I think you're right. So it's maybe a little bit related. So Emanuela had a really nice paper that to improve this step, specifically this conversion step. And I think it might be related to this coherent point drift. So it seems to work, actually. I mean, it's excellent insight. This works really well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, other questions? Ah, absolutely, yes. OK. So. Uh, okay, maybe let, I, I'll skip the first one, um, even though I like it a lot, but one this, I just mentioned very briefly. So basically one question is, can you actually kind of introduce this <laughs> orthogonality constraint directly into the optimization, right? So I mentioned that what we do typically is we kind of drop it first, 
And then we kind of introduce it during pulse refinement. And there are actually quite nice ways to introduce it during the problem itself. Um, so there are some manifold optimization techniques. Okay, But I'm not going to go into too much detail. So let me show another extension. So basically, uh, there's this question of what do you do in map in, in shape collections? Okay, so in what I, I've talked about so far is you just have a pair of shapes and you want to find correspondences. But often, you know, they, they come kind of within a habitat, so you have a, a collection of shapes. And one of the things that you often want is a kind of a, a loop closure. So basically, if I consider points on the so here I have four sh uh, shapes, and if I map this point onto this shape, and then onto th this shape, and onto this shape, and map it back, I expect this loop to close, right? So a kind of uh, one measure of quality for correspondences in a collection is that they have to be consistent, right? So they have to kind of come back onto themselves. And so a bad correspondence would be a one where basically you start with this point and then you end up with this point, right? If you kind of iterate these correspondences. And one question is how do you kind of use this um, during computation? Um, so one kind of, if you think of, basically I said that map composition becomes matrix multiplication. So if you write this constraint in this functional language, it basically means that the product of all of these functional maps between all of these shapes should give you identity. So if I go around the loop, I should come back to identity, right? So now the question is how do you actually uh, use this? Um, so one difficulty is that if you just use this particular constraint, then you lose uh, uh, the linear least squares, right? Because now you're dealing with products of matrices, and this is a non-quadratic constraint. Like if you take a norm, then it's a, it's a complex constraint. So how do you incorporate this kind of constraint, but do it efficiently? And so there's been a re some really nice work um, done for this. And, and the, 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 the basic idea in a lot of this is to create what they call a kind of a latent shape. So basically, suppose I have a network, so I have a set of shapes, right? And I have some maps between these pairs of shapes. Now, let's imagine there was some kind of a, a kind of hidden shape that's in this, maybe it's not even a real shape, but some kind of hidden space. So that basically to find a correspondence between, you know, shape one and shape two, instead of going directly from one to two, I first go to this kind of hidden space and then I go to two, okay? And what you can show is that if this is true, so if I have, if all of my maps go through this kind of uh, centroid shape, then they have to be consistent, right? So it's actually very easy to prove that basically if all of the maps go through these, through this kind of hidden space, then th this consistency is automatically enforced. And now the question is, how do you actually kind of uh, uh, use this in, in, in an algorithm? And the idea is actually, I mean, I think it's very nice and, and, and leads to an, a nice optimization problem. So basically, suppose that I have uh, uh, some uh, correspondences Cij. So these are correspondences, these are maps between pairs of shapes in this collection, right? And now I imagine that I'm trying to find these maps from this hidden shape to each of the shapes. So I basically my yi, so this y1, y2, and so on, is just a correspondence between this uh, latent shape and, and all the other shapes. And what I'd like to find, I'd like to basically find these yi's such that approximately the input uh, correspondence to cij are, can be expressed as this you know, product, right, of the first going to the uh, latent shape and then going onto the target shape. And um, the, the sort of the, 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 the nice thing is that you can take this energy and then if you put yi on the left, then this basically creates the following energy. So I'm looking for the minimum, the, the, the optimal y that would give me a kind of a smallest possible error, right? And so um, the, there is a set of algorithms that I've in uh, papers from 2013 and 14, where this, the, and actually the very basic idea is very simple and you can implement it also very easily, where essentially you start with basically a collection of shapes, you find correspondences between some pairs or maybe all pairs, and then, you know, these correspondences are not going to be consistent because you just do it independently for every pair. And now the question is, how do you kind of enforce this consistency? So what you do is you basically have these guess, initial guess CIJs. These are functional maps. They're not point-to-point -point maps. Um, and then you find the optimal Y that would give you this, the smallest error, right? And if you introduce this constraint that Y transpose Y is equal to identity, then finding the optimal Y is actually reduces to an eigenvalue problem of some very large matrix, right? And you can basically construct an algorithm where um, you first solve for the CIJs, then for you solve for the Ys, and then you use this term to basically resolve for the CIJs to make them more consistent, 
So the, 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 the algorithm looks like this. So given a collection of maps, CIJ, and um, some latent functions y, I, I write down an energy that depends on both c and y, which is just the energy I wrote down. And the algorithm is given you know, uh, c, first find y, given y, find c. And the first one, if, if, if c is fixed, this is an eigenvalue problem. And if y is fixed, this is a least squares problem. So both can be uh, solved pretty efficiently. Okay? And uh, um, you have to be a bit careful in terms of, for example, what is the dimensionality of these y's. So typically, it's, it helps to reduce the dimensionality of the y's a bit to kind of remove noise. The other thing you have to be a bit careful is um, if you do this kind of blindly, you can end up with zero solution, or you can end up with something that's very far from your initial guess. So it also helps to kind of add a regularizing, regularizing term that in the second step, I don't want to go too far from the initial guess. Okay. But this works quite well, actually. So if I have a collection of shapes, without any prior information, you can, by using this consistency idea, you can improve correspondences fairly. Okay. Um, 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 so when you compute C, then you have choice of K, right? You show the plot. Right. Right. Has someone tried doing like, some sort of approach to find the over K? But then I think maybe introducing this intermediate wise may not be necessary to solve for low k, mm -hmm. then the complexity of the c's mm -hmm. is not lower, and that right. reduces right. the next level of c. Because this introducing the wise is a really nice way to the nice right. idea that can yeah. cause some artificial restrictions if there are different clusters of shapes. That's true. That's true. I don't know. The I work. don't know any work that has done multi-scale. I don't. Know. Do you? No. I I haven't seen. Uh, I mean, it's a natural idea, but I. One issue that is a bit. Oh, I guess I have to go too far. But one issue is that you know, if you don't have this diagonal structure, it's kind of not easy to know where to cut, right? Because you actually have mixing between eigenvalues, and if I look at only a subspace, I you know, it's basically looking at a, a kind of a lower left rectangle. Right. Yeah. Right. I think it makes sense. I haven't seen anyone do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But this is basically how you can improve kind of collect you know maps and collections. And so one of the or there are two main applications are uh, shape co-segmentation. So if I have a collection of shapes, so this is a work uh, from. Uh, uh, Ching Huang um, and colleagues from SIGGRAPH 2014, where they basically first compute maps between pairs of shapes, and then they use this, they use them to, and they use this kind of consistent uh, 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 framework to find uh, consistent segmentations. And one of the ideas is that you can actually interpret these Ys as functions on each of the shape, and they, you know that they have to kind of agree with each other, and you can use it to find consistent segmentations. So they, they do co-segmentation basically of a collection of like man-made objects using this idea. Um, I mean, again, of course, there are like many other steps involved, but that's sort of the main high-level idea. And also, they uh, uh, the same set of authors they they have done co-segmentation of images. So basically, you can apply the same exact idea on images and use this uh, sort of consistent uh, uh, maps and collections to find co-segmentation of images to find, for example. You know, to say like you have a collection of, of photos and you don't actually. So this is a different problem, for example, from from image labeling. So you don't have the labels. You just have to basically find the objects that look kind of consistent on the on the images. So they've used the same same idea there. Okay. So this AI, I think, allows you to model non-isometric like structures, right? Uh, I mean, if you when, when we apply without the consistency, the, the model is that your C, your C should essentially be completely diagonal. Right. But here, when you right. say that the leg of your chair is of different types, and they are not essentially right. diagonal to the C in this thing. Yeah. But when you apply the consistency, I think uh, it accounts for. Yes, it's definitely yeah. true. It's definitely so true. these are so like, these are like kind of independent building blocks, right? So the consistency is totally, in, you know, it doesn't care about isometry. It doesn't care about any distortion, right? Um, but in order to compute this consistent maps, you typically have to start with initial guess pairwise maps. And there, you typically need a, a model for distortion, right? So I would say we don't know right now to, 
I mean, we don't have tools that would solve any kind of correspondence problem, so we have some like general models. So isometry is one. But what is kind of remarkable to me, I mean, like I wasn't like on these papers, but to me it's really amazing that they could get these results to basically using some model that's very weak, right? So it doesn't actually make sense to use, uh, let's say, uh, isometry model in this can, kind of cases, but it still provides enough information that you can then kind of use in this consistency framework. So, yeah. Okay, so yeah, maybe just uh, in, so I, maybe one, to mention one very recent result in the last two minutes, so basically, um, one question that we had is, when does a functional map correspond to a point-to-point -point one? And this turns out to be well known, and I was surprised to find out this has been known from 1930s. Um, uh, so basically there is the following statement. So if you have a pair of functions, so if you have for every pair of functions f and h, if the pointwise product of these two functions is preserved, okay, so for every pair of functions, then the uh, functional map corresponds to point-to-point -point one, right? And so this is actually an algebraic condition on C, right? And one question is, how do you kind of use this condition to improve correspondences? And this is, again, independent of the isometric uh, assumption. This is true in general, right? So any cor functional correspondence corresponds to a point-to-point -point one if and only if it preserves function products, okay? And so um, one thing that we propose is basically to kind of take these descriptors, which previously were just functions that we thought should be preserved, and say, okay, let's create operators that, given a descriptor, it takes a function and it takes a product with a fixed descriptor, okay? And then the same, you can basically co construct the same commutativity diagram, right? So it should be the same as, you know, mapping the function and taking the product with a descriptor, okay? And this is actually quadratic in C, right? And basically, this modifies the energy that I wrote earlier just a tiny bit. We have an extra term, which is, uh, you know, quadratic in C. And uh, um, you basically have the same exact framework to find optimal C. And this turns out to help a lot, right? So basically, you use the same exact descriptors without any additional uh, d deformation model, just saying that not only do the descriptor functions themselves have to be preserved, but also their products with other functions have to be preserved, pointwise products. Okay, and this like is a simple term and it really helps. So let me show a small example. So here we basically use two descriptors. Okay, so like it's a bit hard, but the color corresponds to the number of descriptors and the dotted lines correspond to uh, the old method without this preservation of products and the solid lines correspond to the new, this new method with preservation of products. And even using just like one or two descriptors, using this preservation of products, you can get better results than you would get with like 100 uh, descriptors using this basic method. So this really brings a lot of information, actually. And um, I think this, I mean, this could be, I mean, this is like just one small way in which promoting pointwise maps directly in this functional language can help to improve results. I think there, there are many other ways. So this is just one small example. All right, so in the last minute, let me sh uh, just mention some uh, uh, open problems that I think you guys have already <laughs> mentioned uh, so far. So basically, um, like I said, this is really like work in progress and there's a lot of, uh, uh, I think, work to be done. So first, the biggest question that we have is what is the optimal choice of basis? So this is something that you mentioned, right? Is we have this model for isometries. We know that Laplace Beltrami basis makes sense in this model. How about more general models, right? Can we handle more general deformations by creating better bases, for example, right? Um, another question is, how do we guarantee continuous pointwise maps, right? So the method that I described to converting uh, functional maps to point-to-point -point ones doesn't guarantee that the point-to-point -point map you get is continuous, right, or is a bijection. Can we somehow guarantee continuity, or can we promote continuity even as, an, as a term in the optimization? That's something that we don't know how to do it right now. Um, related to, to the first one is what are the better deformation models? And for example, can we learn deformation models, right? So if I give you a collection of shapes, maybe the distances are not preserved, something else is preserved. Can you kind of learn it from the data is, I think, important. Um, and then there's more general open questions, how much can we do without converting to point-to-point -point maps, right? So for example, we have a, a, a paper in this year's SIGGRAPH where we basically show that you can create consistent uh, uh, um, uh, direction fields by using this kind of uh, mapping between functions without converting to point-to-point -point maps. And it turns out that actually, at least in our application, 
it's better to not convert. Like if you convert, you, you, you introduce a lot of error, high frequency noise. And in certain applications, it's better not to do that. So this is, I think, uh, like a general question of, you know, can you kind of phrase many problems in geometry processing purely in this functional language without going to the primal domain? Or at least how many can you do? Like, is there some inherent problem that you sometimes really need to look at the points? Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for a question or two for a speaker. Barbara Shirley's available during the coffee break. What if the surface has is actually made up of like many different connected components? Sometimes these eigenbase things get confused and want to put lots of yeah. Um, yeah. separated functions. It's true, it's and I, it's, you're totally right. So basically, it's a big problem, actually. So I think, for example, in this work, um, they did, uh, you know, this uh, the co-segmentation that was actually done on uh, like the shape net kind of data, and that also consists of multiple kind of components. And so the standard solution, which is super ugly, is uh, you know just create a graph. So you basically sample points on your shape, and then you create a graph, right? And you just ensure that everything is connected, and you use the Laplacian on the graph, right? Or you know a variant of the Laplacian on the graph to compute the basis. But I agree that it's like a hack, and yeah. So well, what, why are you saying? Is, I don't think it's a big problem, right? So I mean, you would have the location of the disconnected manifold. Why is it a problem? Well, because it's very unstable, right? I mean, you basically the the the, the issue you could have if you have two shapes that are, one is represents as a pair of you know connected components, and one is I mean, you have much more experience on this than me, but. The, the, the problem that the I have is a problem to, to impose some prior on C, right, right. but to solve for C, you, you know. oh sure, oh, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So like, so, like, if you take like all the other building blocks, you know, it's it, it, it like it doesn't depend on this fact. But I think you can run into trouble in terms of stability. This point-to-point -point thing has a problem when its meshes are really of different quality in a sense because the point-to-point -point is actually not from its vertex to vertex. Right, yes, exactly. Yeah. So you can distort the effect you gain while using the low value of right? Yes, definitely. And I think we don't know very well. Yeah, if you consider like even barycentric interpretation, it's not very well, it's like Yeah, but if you do barycentric, I think you need higher frequency. We don't have enough information to really like look at that triangles. Right. Um, but this is really related to this, to this problem of how do you actually get a continuous path. I mean, ideally, we want really like you, yeah, like I completely agree. So you want something that doesn't is not vertex to vertex. I mean, it's like a it's like a handicap. We yeah. should look inside triangles. This makes sense. Right. Right. So this specific step, yeah, right. exactly. The functional right. Right. doesn't have this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So how to, how to do this better in like looking inside triangles? I think it's a great. I mean, I don't. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs>